Welcome to Brain and Avert. As some of you know, we are big fans of sci-fi and philosophy on the show, and we're going to be talking about uh, Dune, one of uh, our favorite uh, pieces of science fiction. Adam Taylor, would you like to start with a segment from Dune? So one of the things that I'm very sort of pleased with in the uh, 2021 Denis Villeneuve version of Dune is that as I experience the movie, it gets one of the main plot points of the story correct, where the 1984 version by David Lynch, which some of your viewers may have seen, gets wrong, which is in the 1984 version, the story ends with Maudie, with Paul Atreides as a traditional messiah figure and as the clear hero of the story. So it ends on an upbeat, hopeful note for the future. But the character of Paul is not uh, a hero. And if anything, he's a sort of tragic figure. And that's largely because of what happens in the aftermath of the events of the first book, which spoiler alert, I tell the story of how his family's transferred to this planet Arrakis to take over uh, the government of the planet. Then they get attacked by the Harkonnens and by the emperor. And the house is destroyed and Paul goes into the desert with his mother. And after lots of trials and tribulations, he emerges sort of uh, victorious over his enemies and establishes a new empire, a new galactic empire. And then there's a time jump between the end of the first book and the beginning of the second book of about 10 years. And during those 10 years, we find out that a, a galactic jihad has occurred in which 60 billion people have been killed, whole planets sterilized, meaning no life left at all, all in the name of Madib or Paul Atreides and the religion that the Fremen build around him. And so, um, this sort of horrifying turn of events happens off screen. And then we're introduced to Paul as an older individual dealing with what's been done in his name and having to come to terms with the fact that there was nothing he could do to stop it, or at least that's what we're told. And the, the, the Denis Villeneuve movie actually makes a point of foreshadowing this, uh, in the scene where Paul is in the still tent with Jessica in the desert. And he tells her, uh, that he has a vision of the Jihad and he says, I can see them worshiping my father's skull in a shrine and building a religion around me. And all of these things actually happen in Dune. They build a, a shrine of the skull in Araki. And so it sort of captures the idea that Paul is a prisoner to a fate that he finds morally objectionable and terrible. Um, and it involves these 60 billion people who are going to be killed uh, in the Fremen Jihad to spread his religion. And what's interesting to me about that is that the way it's presented in the novels, this Jihad is unavoidable and an absolute necessity. And it's only talked about dimly during Paul's lifetime, but it's the golden path, which is a, a course of events that must unfold in order for humanity to survive. And so what we find out is that if the Jihad hadn't occurred and if subsequent events hadn't gone the way they went, uh, humanity would have been wiped out in just a couple of thousand years during the time span of the novels, humanity would have been completely extinct. And so Paul's doing what he did sort of sets humanity on the path of its ultimate survival, even though Paul is horrified by what happens. And so what's interesting is this idea that you could have a individual who has Paul's particular mental gifts and his ability to see the present, the past and the future. And he is now in this position where he knows that certain absolutely horrifying atrocities must occur in order for humanity to survive. And he's, he alone can make the decision for those horrifying atrocities to occur. He has to set this all in motion and allow it to happen. And so what I'm interested in is the sort of moral uh, valence of a decision like this. If you actually had the knowledge that this was the only way to save humanity, is it the right thing to do to make this decision to allow this atrocity or these atrocities to occur? in order to save humanity, or might it not be better, uh, to, uh, not act and not, uh, choose uh, to allow these things, even knowing that humanity is going to be destroyed ultimately, right? That's the moral dilemma that, uh, 
the character finds himself in that I find really fascinating. So I like the thought experiment or the plot point because it seems like a cleaner version of a different problem that we've discussed once on this show. So uh, we had a guest on the show uh, named Aaron Fasser, and we discussed whether it's ever permissible to let off a really big nuke in a populated area. And the question is, is it ever okay to do that to save so many more people in a much larger war that can be prevented or stopped? And Aaron's view and many philosophers and legal practitioners view is that it's almost never permissible. Why? Because there's not just two options. There's more than two options. You might uh, try uh, harder sanctions first, or you might try uh, to avoid the war in other ways other than through nuclear warfare. What's nice about this example is that it, it basically delimits the possibilities to two. So either humanity dies out in, in a few generations or humanity enters onto this golden path and survives despite billions being killed in a jihad. When you've got that clean choice, it seems it's easier to answer in favor of the jihad. It's easier to say we can sacrifice X number of lives because the X is smaller than the whole. It's smaller than all lives, the full population. The utilitarian says, well, that's what you got to do, right? Mark is going to have a harder time as he leans more towards Kantianism. So he's going to say, well, this is more complicated. But what's nice about the case is that a lot of the, the, the mechanisms that Mark and Aaron use in these discussions can't be used here. Trying to find a middle path, trying to find the third solution. The book, the story is just constructed in such a way by hypothesis that there's only two options. Yeah, so I suppose to sort of point out some of the difficulties with utilitarianism, this is quite a bullet to bite. It's only 60 billion people. I don't mind cracking my teeth on that. Inter intergalactic jihad? I mean, is it that bad, guys? I mean, come on. So uh, this is the difficulties you're going to have. And of course, the utilitarian just goes and whips out a calculator because basically you guys are a bunch of shopkeepers and bean counters and adds up the numbers and goes, well, this one's higher. So I guess that's the way we go. But no discussion whatsoever about how those people die, whether it's active or passive. You guys don't care at all because you're a bunch of bean counters. Someone who cares about the rights and intentions is going to ask a bunch of more sophisticated questions like, well, hold on a second here. There's a difference between allowing things to happen versus taking active measures. So knowing how humanity is going to become extinct is going to make a difference. Also, you might say, well, look, I'm not instructing these Fremens to go out and commit this genocide. I just have the foreknowledge that they're going to do these horrible things. And I might try and plead with them not to do it. I might try and take these other things. I just know this is how it's going to go because of this curse of foreknowledge that I have. I mean, here's the interesting question. Is, is there a moral choice at all to be made? given that Paul has insights into the future. Is the whole thing not just cast in stone already? So I am more sympathetic to, to your view than you might think, Mark. So the novels makes it clear that Paul's power raises a lot of questions about the nature of free will. When one of these prophets like Paul exists, they un unwittingly actually set humanity on a particular course just by the fact that they've seen the future. So just seeing it makes it happen, right? And so to get to your original point, it does seem like maybe Paul doesn't have a choice. Maybe Paul has to take the course that he takes because of his condition, he's trapped into taking this course that even to him is repugnant morally. He doesn't want to do it. And yet he explicitly says on more than one occasion that if he hadn't done it, it would have been worse, not better. So the futures that he saw, this was the best possible outcome of those futures. So I don't know uh, where that. So there's an interesting ambiguity here. If we think about theories about the nature of time, one view might be that you've got uh, a garden of forking paths, that you've got this infinitesimal amount of different possibilities which could be there. And that a being like Paul, who seems to really have kind of godlike powers, as you say, this, this great omniscience can look at all the paths and select one of those paths and say, this is the best path. And this is the future that I'm going to bring into existence. And that then implies that there's some deliberation going on, that there is some kind of moral responsibility. And depending on which moral theory we plug in, 
whether it really is the best um, path that's going to make a difference, whether that's the best on utilitarian accounts or the best on some Kantian account. But it's not clear to me that that is what's going on. I mean, maybe it's the case that these visions that Paul has aren't necessarily the best. That's not a matter of deliberating between options. It's that you see that and the act of seeing it crystallizes a certain future. And there could have been other futures that would have been better. Oh, oh yeah. That, that's what I was trying to say. Yes, that's right. That's what, that's, that's explicitly what Herbert says. That's what I meant by unwittingly, right? So just his, just his very act of Paul's very act of glancing, what eventually is going to be called the golden path. It locks humanity into a course that there is no getting out of, but it is true that Paul also says that this was the, the only outcome that would have, he, he basically when he's questioned about it or when he questions himself about it, his response is to say that all the other options were worse. So whatever they may have been, right. It wasn't going to go better than it is. And this is the part that he's, he finds, or at least when we, when we find him in the, in the, in Dune Messiah, this is the part that he is having trouble living with is knowing that he has locked things into this course, but it's not his fault. Because, and I think it's important to keep this in mind, he's the first human that's ever been able to do all of this. So he doesn't know until it's too late that by looking at this, he's already caused this to happen, right? That's the trap of, of prescience that he falls into. So then there's an interesting question, which is the act of seeing that future. Is that an act or is that a passive reception or perception of the future? So. One of the interesting puzzles in the philosophy of action is what exactly constitutes an action? Is a decision without uh, overt physical action still an action? So, so are there mental actions? Can you decide to see the future? If so, it seems like him deciding to look into the future and crystallize it in that way does give him some moral responsibility over that future that ensues. It seems like he's the causal nexus for that future. But if that future comes to him like a vision, like when you open your eyes and then there's a scene in front of you that you didn't choose, then maybe we don't think so. Maybe we don't think that he's morally responsible for that future. So there's, there's interesting questions around whether our mental actions constitute moral responsibility or not, or are sufficient for moral responsibility. Yeah. And I think that there's an interesting distinction that's made in Roderick Chisholm's uh, paper on human freedom and responsibility, where Chisholm refers back to an earlier view that Aristotle had held that basically there's a distinction to be made between doing something and making something happen. And the distinction is one on the role of the agent. So that there are lots of cases where agents make things happen but they're not necessarily doing them. And so the example that Aristotle uses is that the staff strikes the stone and the hand moves the staff. And basically the idea then is you have a causal chain that emits from a, or originates with the decision of an agent. The agent says, I'm going to move this staff and in moving the staff, it strikes the stone. Right. This is also used to discuss the difference between transient and imminent causation. So transient causation is basically event A causing event B. Imminent causation is an agent decides to do something and this causes event B or something like that. So what Chisholm winds up saying is we make a lot of things happen, even though we're not causing them to happen. So when I get up and move across the room, I make a bunch of air molecules move out of my way or move around me or whatever. Uh, causing it. I'm not doing it. It's not a deliberate action of mine. It's just a result of something that I've done. And I think we can apply it in this way, in this case, that look, Paul, by using his power, his oracular vision to look into all of these possible futures, he makes a certain future happen. It's not clear in the writing that he had any idea that this was going to be the case necessarily, that he knew that you know, using this ability and looking at things this way was going to cause these events to occur. And this seems to have been the trap that he falls into that since there's never been anyone like him, there's no way for him to know. And this is the difference between Paul as a character and his son, Leto II, in the God Emperor of Dune and in Children of Dune, where Leto is already born with all of Paul's memory. So he knows everything that Paul knows. And he understands that if I use this power, I run the risk of eliminating everybody's free will and locking us all into a particular course of action. 
And so he refuses to do it. He decides I'm not going to use the power often. He does a little bit, but he basically makes a deal that he's not going to use it like his father had used it. And in that way, he's going to preserve more freedom basically, because it's important to, again, the path that he wants to put humanity on. So there's another interesting thing that you mentioned, this idea that memories can carry on to descendants. So Paul has the memories of all of his ancestors and his son has his memories. When we think about the nature of personal identity, you know, and the nature of what it is to survive, one of the ideas is that you could survive your body's death if we could take all of your memories and put them into some other body. So if we could upload them into the cloud, 3D print a flesh suit for you, put those memories back in, we might think, well, you've survived. Derek Parfit described teleportation cases. Jason has written about this quite a bit in his novels. What's interesting here is that it's not that you've got one memory which moves into some other body, it's that you've got multiple memories in one body. And so the question is, is Paul a singular being? Or is this many beings housed in one physical body? So in the case of Paul, it's portrayed in such a way that he retains his ego. And this is because Paul takes the water of life. So I should explain. There's a ceremony that the Fremen do whenever they want to make somebody a reverend mother. So or as they call it, a Sayadina in their religious tradition. And it involves basically this ritual where the acolyte drinks a fluid that's harvested from drowning sand trout, which is the infant version of the giant sandworms that you see in all the promotional uh, material. They're very small when they're young and you take one of these small sand trout and you drown it. And as it dies, it exudes this liquid essence which is a very, very, very powerful psychotropic substance. And when the Bene Gesserit take the, the, the water of life, as it's called, it unlocks certain powerful prescient abilities, even in the regular Bene Gesserit. And the thing is among the Bene Gesserit and among the, the Sayadinas of the Fremen, this is always done at a much later point in life. They always do this as adults so that by the time they transmute the water of life, they already have a strong sense of their own ego and their own desires and their own sort of knowledge of the world. And so Paul falls into that camp. By the time he, he becomes aware of all of his other memories, they don't have the same effect on him because he just has a much stronger sense of himself than his children do or than Alia does. What's really interesting is in the case of Alia, who winds up being possessed by the, uh, persona of Baron Harkonnen and being driven mad by it shows you that it's not just some ability to remember someone else's memory as though it was your own memory. It's actually the Baron in her mind. He's alive and he's trying to lead her to her destruction and to destroy House Atreides at the same time. And so it's still him. And it's actually really fascinating, this idea that somehow these people some part of them lives on inside anybody who's able to access their memories. Yeah, it's an interesting problem that actually crops up in a lot of different science fiction. I mean, not exactly the same problem, but a similar problem of inheriting lots of different memories and then trying to distinguish yourself and figure out who you are in relation to all these previous people. So in Star Trek, there's a race, the Trill, that accumulates lifetimes through this little worm that's inside you and it gets transplanted from body to body. And that worm accumulates all the memories of all the bodies it's been in before. And there's these puzzles throughout many of the Star Trek um, episodes where the person who has the worm in them at the time has to work out who they are. And then in Stargate, there's also uh, a race with the same issue. And there, the relationship between past memories and the current person is more parasitic. So it's also a worm that gets placed into, into humans and that worm is placed against their will and they uh, have to take on uh, these memories and the personas of the persons before them. So this is a, a theme that's discussed in a lot of different science fiction. What's interesting is that if you think about the different accounts of personal identity, so if your account of personal identity is a psychological account, so what makes you who you are is your memories and your psychological profile, 
then it generates this problem. Who am I? Am I the person corresponding to the body that was born before the worm was implanted in me or before all the memories arrived in my conscious mind? But if you have a biological or a physical account of identity, then I am definitely just the person who was there before the worm was implanted. So it seems like the, the animal account or the biological account, or the physicalist account doesn't have this problem that it doesn't have to weigh these options, whereas the psychological account does. Yeah, I think that's right. And I, this is why I, I say, I think, I think Herbert's sort of thinking about personal identity in Dune, or at least how it works in that world. I don't know if this is what he really, I don't know if he was inspired by sort of Jungian archetypes or some other sort of, I, I know apparently he at one point had read about a study that had been done with flatworms, which showed that you could, I can't remember exactly how this goes, but basically you could teach a flatworm of one generation to perform a certain type of task or something like that. And then you would find that a subsequent generation would be able to do the same task or something like this. So he might have been sort of interested in this idea that memory can be transferred genetically. But what's really unique about his sort of view of the, the, the human person is that he has aspects of both. So he definitely seems to think that well, what it is to be a particular person is to have a particular bundle of memories. But at the same time, he, at least for these extraordinary characters with the Bene Gesserit training, he basically makes it the case that they can call up at any given time, the persona of people who existed earlier than them. And he also does the same thing. So not just with Paul and Jessica in the Atreides line, there's also really interesting things he does with the face dancers. And with the golas in the later, so golas are basically artificially biologically engineered clones of, uh, people, real people. So the most famous case, this is a huge spoiler if you haven't read the books, but the most famous case is Duncan Idaho. And so after Duncan Idaho sacrifices himself to save the Atreides, basically people realize this is too valuable to human being to allow the genetic material to go to waste. I mean, he takes out. I can't remember what it is, 12 Sardaukar single-handedly in that corridor, and this is unheard of. So basically they whisk away his body to the technocracy planet, the, uh, Bene Tleilax, and the Tleilax regenerate him into a living clone who doesn't initially possess any of Duncan Idaho's memories, but who they train as a Zen Sunni philosopher and as a Mentat. And they send him back to the court of Paul Atreides as quote unquote, a psychological poison to try and undo his, um, rise to power. Uh, and what happens eventually is we find out through a whole bunch of different things, trials occur. There's a, there's a sort of stressful incident that occurs and Duncan Idaho's original memories are restored and he knows who he is. And then he becomes the Duncan Idaho that he was right. Which shows you two things. One that Herbert is committed to the idea that memory is indicative of identity or constitutive of identity, I should say, but it also shows you too, that he still believes memory is, uh, biological and genetic because the memories are still in the clone, right? Even though his mind's been completely wiped and he's some, something else, the memory, the core of who he is somehow remains genetically inside Duncan Idaho and they're able to bring it out under the right conditions and break the conditioning and turn him back into who he was. So that's one example. Then there are the face dancers who are these shape-shifting assassins that the Twilight Action Masters use to try and attack all the other great houses and whatnot. And the interesting thing about them is if they assume the physical shape of an individual for too long and assume their habits for too long, they literally become that person. If they're too good at their job as a shape-shifting infiltrator, they literally forget that they're a shape-shifting infiltrator and they become the person that they're pretending to be, which I think again, shows you that he's thinking that there's something physical that is the basis of uh, personal identity. And I think that goes well with an animalist view, right? It's just that he adds this sort of element of 
a sort of Lockean memory theory to it, that somehow memory is biological and it's being able to have the memories in your genetic material that enables you to be the person that you are over time, which is really interesting. Because a lot of times people who prefer a sort of psychological account, they don't want to have the biological part and vice versa. And so his view is interesting because it's a, definitely a hybrid. It's both a psychological view of identity, but it's also clearly a strongly biological view of identity. You really do have to have the right biological constituents. So you made a comment right at the beginning, which is that you were glad that the Deneuve film had certain features which were not in the Lynch film. And so if we think about what it is to adapt a work, I wonder if you think that there are better and worse ways to do it. And Dune's been adapted in a number of ways. So there's the two films we've talked about, there's graphic novels, there's a TV series, there's even a fantastic board game called the Dune Imperium. When we're looking at adaptations, should we view them in their own lights? Is it, is it only fair to judge an adaptation by how much fidelity it has to the original source material? Or can it surpass that? So my own view about this is, and the reason why I say I'm glad that he, he presents Paul as the, the figure, the tragic figure that he really is. I say that largely because I think that it makes Paul a more interesting character. I think that the Messiah trope has been done literally to death. And I think one of the things that makes, uh, Dune, Dune for me is Herbert's insistence on the danger of charismatic leadership, particularly charismatic religious leadership. And the idea that, that stagnation is death and that you must always be seeking out challenges and adversity in order to grow and develop. These are the themes that sort of, I think, make the story what it is. And they're aesthetically, uh, pleasing as well as in my mind, philosophically more interesting. I've seen the Messiah stories done to death. And so it was, I, I will say, I hope this isn't too much of an aside, but I will say I, I was born in 1975. And so I grew up with the, the 1984 David Lynch version of Dune. And it was a real shock to me when I went and read the books as in my late teens, early twenties and realized that no, this isn't the story of a Messiah and that Paul is not a particularly heroic, uh, superhero sort of character. He's a tragic figure and it made the story a lot richer to me and a lot more interesting to me. And so I think for that reason, I would say, I think Denis Villeneuve's adaptation is you know, better from my point of view, because I think that it's more aesthetically pleasing. And I think that it's more philosophically interesting. I, I don't necessarily think that it's bad to have an adaption that lacks those features. So it's not as though I think Herbert wrote this, so it must be canon. So you must get this right. Right. Because I think that that's narrow-minded and also just personal view. I don't think artists owe me anything. So if they make the story they want to make, so be it. Like I think Joe Dorowski's Dune would have been fascinating, but it also wouldn't have been anything at all like the Frank Herbert version of Dune. I mean, not even close to the Frank Herbert version. It would have been its own thing and it probably would have been amazing to see, but you know, yeah. So that's my thinking about that. It's just, I, I want to have a version that's more aesthetically pleasing. And I think this is, and I think it's just a better, it's a better use of our time to remind people that charismatic leaders are dangerous. And that if you have a story that is able to make this point so explicit and make it so well, I think that's really important for people to hear. So in that sense, I think it has a lot of merit. On a little side note right now, stop what you're doing. Stop watching this episode. Go and watch Jodorowsky's Dune. It's fantastic. And then stop watching that and go and watch The Holy Mountain made by Jodorowsky, which is the best movie ever made. It will completely blow your mind. You'll realize that his version of Dune would have been astoundingly strange and amazing. Yeah. So what's very interesting about this discussion is that although these philosophical problems, I think you've expressed them really well and expressed the complexity of them and how well they're explored in the book and the very interesting dilemmas that they raise, but those aren't the reason that I fell in love with Dune when I first read it and watched it. I love Dune because of the world building. So a lot of the discussion that you've had is based on the character of Paul Atreides and, and sure there is some world building elements involved in the way that biology constructs memory. But I, what I find so fascinating about Dune are these different houses and races and how they're given very different features 
And in the interplay between those, the technology and those races, it just generates an infinite set of interesting possibilities. That's more of an aesthetic appreciation of the series and why I think it makes just such compelling reading and, and viewing. And the, the philosophical problems that you've, that you've expressed only really occurred to me much later, but it was that setting, that gorgeous aesthetic setting with this amazing world building element that, that really captivated me. Yeah, I agree with you. And I think it's also a central element of the story. And I've tried to, I haven't said much about this and I've tried to avoid it explicitly, but uh, th this really does bear pointing out. This takes us back to our original uh, discussion. The whole idea of the necessity of the jihad and of the eventual tyrannical rule of House Atreides under Leto II. So basically what happens is Paul is born into the Imperium, which is a political structure that, as you say, it involves these great houses which control planetary fiefs or kingdoms. They're in an organization called the Landsrad, which is like a giant parliament where the members of the parliament are basically members of these great houses that control entire planets. And there are trillions of humans alive at this point. And the Lanzarot is one part of the power structure. The other part is the emperor at the beginning, it's the emperor Shaddam the fourth of house Carino. House Carino has ruled the known universe for 10,000 years at the point where Paul is brought into the story. And then the other two major players are what are, uh, what's called the Chome company of C H O A M combined on it over advancer mercantile which is a basically universal monopoly on all trade goods controlled by the Lanzarod and the, the emperor together with silent partners being the Bene Gesserit order and the spacing guild and the spacing guild are the third major power because they control all transportation in the universe, right? So this is the political structure of the Imperium, the spacing guild, the Lanzarod the emperor and this chome company that controls all mercantile trade, right? And it's into this universe that Paul is born. And of course, in this universe, the most important commodity is the spice from Arrakis that enables uh, the guild navigators to fold or to see different paths through space so that they can safely navigate. And the reason why is because 10,000 years earlier, there was a violent jihad across the galaxy to get rid of all artificial intelligence. So computers could not be designed to do astronomical calculations. So the only way that you can uh, safely navigate through folded space is to be able to see the future and know which path to take. And that's what the guild navigators do. So Paul's born into this structure. The jihad, when it happens, obliterates the structure. Paul becomes the sole possessor of all political power. He takes over the empire. He diminishes the power of the Lanzarote, makes them completely irrelevant. All of the Chone company comes under the holdings of House Atreides. So he now controls all trade in the universe. And because he's so much more powerful than the Bene Gesserit, he basically puts them in their place and takes control over everything that they would have done also. Focuses all power on one sovereign, basically, right? And this is necessary so that when Leto comes to power, who is his son, right? He will be able to literally put a stranglehold on the entirety of humanity for three and a half thousand years while secretly taking over. So for example, the two societies, we haven't said much about the Ixians who make devices. They're not quite artificially intelligent, but they're very, they're, they make all the technological gear. So in the movies, when you see people flying in ships, the Ixians made all of that. When you see the. Ornithopters, the Ixians made those two. The protection, the shield devices they use, Ixians, right? The Ixians make all of the tech. They're the only uh, planet that's allowed to make technology. The Tlilaxu specialize in genetic monstrosities and genetic alterations of humans. All of these things come under Leto's control. He gets rid of the sandworms, terraforms the planet, diminishes the supply of spice, makes it so that nobody can travel. There's no threat to his power. Thousands of years of stagnation, uh, enforced while he carries out a breeding program to make people immune to his prescient vision. And while he secretly funds the Ixians to develop new technologies and yet doesn't allow it, them to sell it to anybody but him. So that when he 
dies at the end of book four, again, huge spoiler, when he dies, there's this scattering of humanity into the known universe as far as they can possibly go because they've been stagnated for so long that they do not want, they don't want to be held up in one place anymore. And this is what guarantees the survival of humanity. They go so far, so fast that no one threat could ever actually wipe out all humans. And he's made them invisible to prophets like himself, prescient beings like himself, so that nobody can hunt them down and destroy them. And that's how he basically saves humanity. So to me, I agree with you. I think the world building is all really amazing and fascinating. And I also think it's vital to understand why, why Paul and Leto have to do what they do and destroy the old Imperium and break up its political structure to keep humans from stagnating because Leto eventually in the fourth book, in the middle of the fourth book, he tells one of the other characters, if I hadn't ruled by now, all of humanity would have been extinct, right? So if he hadn't done what he did to rule for 3000 years, humanity would have already been wiped out because the old political structure, beautiful as it is. It was stagnation and it was going to kill them all basically. So this gives me some deep insight into one of uh, Jason's most notorious views. His view is that, uh, the best thing for humanity would be to make earth so awful to live in that we are driven off planet. So he's very much in favor of uh, global warming. Elon Musk has been taking the hint cause he's like ready to jet set off to Mars. And uh, I see that this is this notion that if humanity gets a little bit too complacent, it'll wind up just living on earth. It'll get wiped out by some asteroid. There was an asteroid half the size of a giraffe that hit us a couple of days ago. Who knows what's coming next guys. What's interesting about this is of course the ultra authoritarian bent of all of it. This idea that you have one leader who imposes his will on, on humanity to kind of get this alleged greater good. And uh, what worries me about this, of course, is that there are many authoritarians, uh, who seem to think that they have a, a wonderful treasure in mind and, in, in, and why they have to sort of stomach the deaths of a few people along the way so they can get this noble good going forward. If I think about someone like Vladimir Putin right now, very happy for the greater unity of, of Russia to go and kill innocent civilians in Ukraine. And this is the authoritarian might against the sort of uh, poor innocent collective. It seems like the authoritarianism is coincidental though, right? So the, the authoritarianism in Dune is very much part of the story, but you can imagine things going the way of the greater good without, um, anything more than an invisible hand. So global warming is happening without one particular tyrant driving it. It's, it's happening. It's just, it's, it's, it's really because there's no authority stopping it from happening. So you can have mechanisms that drive these global goods coincidentally without needing to cite an authority. It just so happens that in the Dune case, you do need the authority because without the authority, it's going to go the other way. Yeah, I think that's right. I think it's just, well, I mean, for one thing, it's obviously storytelling, right? He wants to tell a through line about this particular family and all of its achievements and the good and the horrible things that they do. I, I have to say, it, I kind of agree with Jason because I think one of the things that I took from reading Dune as a teenager and as a young person that stuck with me for my entire life was my commitment to the idea that it should be an absolute imperative to put it in Kantian terms for the human race to get off of earth. I, I, and I think a lot of people who are inclined toward future futurism and toward thinking about the future, like Herbert was, I think they would agree with Herbert about this, that one of the things that's imperative is we have to spread out and we have to, to ensure the, um, survival of our species. We have to begin to populate new environments that aren't on this planet because this planet's not always going to be able to sustain us. Obviously what's interesting to me about that though, is the assumption, and this goes back to, to what I originally started off with saying, so, you know, the idea of Paul's moral dilemma or Paul's moral problem is that in order to ensure the survival of the human species, he has to allow the jihad because he has to crush the power structure of the old Imperium and establish a new one. So that ultimately Leto, who at the, at that time he couldn't even see. So. Leto was a sort of blind spot to Paul. He's Paul is actually surprised when Chani gives birth to twins. He had no idea that that was going to happen. One of the few things he didn't know, which is really fascinating, but he needs, or he allows the jihad to happen because it's necessary 
to save humanity from this ultimate destruction that's looming in the future. And so the idea then is well, he's stuck in this dilemma that he has to engage in these actions in order, or he has to allow these things to unfold in order for humanity to ultimately be saved. And one of the assumptions built into that, that I'm really kind of interested in is the assumption that humanity should be saved, right? There's, there seems to be this assumption that's never really questioned by Paul or by Leto or by any of the prescient beings that there's something valuable in assuring the future survival of humanity. And it's also never explicitly discussed or filled in by any of the characters in the story, why they think that this is the case, right? And it makes me think of David Benatar's work and the idea that maybe the survival of the human race isn't the, the outcome that we should prefer, right? And so that's what makes me a little bit skeptical of the idea. Like on the one hand, I think, yeah, humans have to, if we're going to survive as a species, I think, you know, Herbert's right. We have to leave the planet and go somewhere else. But then on the other hand, I, I guess I'm just skeptical enough to wonder whether or not us surviving as a species is necessarily a good thing in and of itself. Why is that a goal to be achieved? Especially thinking as, as a philosopher, a thinking uh, that everything has to come to an end at some point. So if the only way to extend the lifespan of the species is by such extreme measures of violence and just absolute tyranny. Well, maybe that's not worth it. Maybe that's a deal that we shouldn't be willing to make. Right. So I'm not sure about the assumptions behind that particular view. Yeah. It's interesting. And I I'm sympathetic towards David Benatar's view. We've had him on the show. I, I like Benatar's view as a characterization of whether it is moral to bring new life into existence or whether it is better not to. In other words, I think his position is very plausible when it comes to well-being or, or the rights of people. In other words, morality being the, the, the value being assessed. Where I don't find David's view plausible is on other values. So we've had him on the show and we asked him this question and he said, no, he doesn't think that there are any values to human life that life offers in such abundance that the negative aspects of depriving people of those values in certain ways, which is inevitable in life, doesn't supersede them. So in other words, he thinks that there's no value in life or no value to life that is so great, not even a moral value, but any value, aesthetic, knowledge-based, any, any value in life that, that makes it worth living or at least makes it worth coming into existence. I think he's wrong there. I think there are other values like beauty and aesthetic values, which are, and perfection, which are, which are abundant enough in human life, even if human life on the whole has negative well, or at least that negative well being outweighs its positive aspects, positive well being. There are other values that are important. And if you wipe out humanity, you lose all those values, assuming that humanity is the only bearer of those values. I mean, there might be other alien species, but assuming there isn't, assuming there's just humans, which is all we know about, then it seems very important for the propagation of those values, like art and beauty, that you keep humans around. Otherwise you can't propagate, propagate those values. There's an interesting tension in Jason's view. On the one hand, he's utilitarian um, and so wants to say that the right thing is that which maximizes utility. But I think thinks that there are other kinds of values besides moral values, like things like beauty. But there's still this utilitarian instinct, which is to see people as mere vessels of these other values. In other words, if we could just have the free floating beauty in the sky, if we could just have our utility or our meaning or whatever other value free floating, well, then humanity is kind of just this encumbrance, this thing that has to like carry the stuff. What we really care about is the stuff inside those vessels. I think that's right. You say it like that's a bad thing, but I think that's exactly right. I think that humans, uh, humans imbibe values and they propagate values. But if there was a way to do that without the humans, then that's fine. I mean, if you, if you could generate a, a real art propagation mechanism without humans being involved, then I'm good with that. You know, you just need uh, a very beautiful orgasmatron in the sky and Jason's happy. Uh, yes, maybe. I mean, and, and that is one view of, and, and perhaps a, a very plausible view of how we'll propagate the universe and how we'll explore other stars and other, other planets. It, it won't be us as humans that do it. It'll be machines that carry our 
our values with them. But again, it seems like those machines are going to have to be sentient in some way. Otherwise, they're not going to propagate those values. So that's an interesting point because what I was thinking when you were saying that was, so imagine a, a species level parf parfit style argument where, you know, Parfit wants to say, I'm, I'm sure you guys are uh, up on this stuff, but Patrick wants to say, look, identity doesn't matter. What he's interested in is the R relation of psychological continuity and connectedness. And if you have psychological continuity and connectedness, then that's good enough for survival, basically. And so we might, so just as a thought experiment, we might imagine three different ways it could go for humanity. So let's suppose on the one hand, we have sort of the golden path where in some, some sequence of events, humans wind up spreading far enough, fast enough into the larger galaxy that just as Frank Herbert sort of, uh, foreshadowed, our species is never able to be wiped out by any particular threat. And we continue growing and evolving as a species for, you know, eons, maybe millions of years. And we have some late descendants who are post human in a, they have human DNA, but they're so much more advanced than us that they're hardly recognizable. They'd be more like super advanced aliens or something like that. Then on the other hand, you have, um, humans going extinct, right? But leaving behind, uh, artificially intelligent machines that are capable of appreciating our, um, aesthetic and our scientific and our sort of non-moral achievements, whatever those may be, our historical achievements, our aesthetic achievements, our scientific achievements, right? And then in the third case. You have the ultimate annihilation of the human species and everything that we, um, value is completely lost. Right. I think, look, A and B are both preferable to C and I don't really have any strong intuition about between A and B, which one would be better, right? Distant biological descendants who are somehow connected to us as a species and remember our accomplishments and carry forward with them or just machines doing the same thing. Right. That are intelligent enough to comprehend what we've done. Like to me, that seems to be just as, or at least plausibly just as good. They'd be our closest continuers and, and it doesn't matter whether they're biological or not biological. It seems like as long as our, as long as our accomplishments are being, you know, carried forward, then that's all that really uh, is necessary. So I, in that sense, I can see thinking that the survival of the species is relatively unimportant, but on the other hand, <laughs> It's also, there is also something to be said for just wanting a moral theory that gives us more protection for the kinds of things that we happen to be and would want to protect humanity and try to ensure the survival of human persons because we have value. So I, I'm inclined also to agree with Mark a little bit. I, I'm not a dyed in the wool utilitarian. So I'm inclined to think, yeah, persons have some value beyond just being receptacles for a certain kinds of values that personhood itself matters in some degree.